for the debate. I am here today. It's my great pleasure to have this lecture on representation learning. Okay. And yeah, my name is Florian Bush. Um, my pay is still out of this country at Europe's. Um, so that's why I'm taking over. First of all, because I'm not assuming any prior knowledge, um, let's get into some motivation. And I try to make this a bit interactive. Um, you have heard about cosmic memory by now. Now let's um, look at images, because I mean, images, machine learning, really interesting. Um, I want you to do cause discovery on that image. What would you say? Okay. So then it would make sense to like argue that here we have a cause and this is the effect and then this acts as a cause for the next effect. So it's plausible to assume that there are some causal relations we can observe here, right? Um, still, which algorithm would you use to uncover that? Let's look at another image. Um, traffic, congestion. Again, it's plausible that there are Causes and effects happening somewhere in there, right? I hope. So, which algorithm do you want to input this into to get some causal meaning and results from that? Or even one last example another image. Now, let's ignore the algorithm question for now and just say what are even the cause and effects here? What's the cause? What's the effect? Possible? Do you want to add something? And maybe we can consider the order in which they have uh, when it's on each other, because some order might be um, not plausible or not positively plausible in this setting. I also wouldn't say this is necessarily false. Um, but I think you get the idea that this is already really difficult to say. Um, one big uh, challenge in general is that, first of all, we have a list of like, I don't know, 200 times 500 or whatever pixels. Um, we, we don't really want to use these as variables because for one, it's very high dimensional. And we definitely see, OK, there are other things we would identify as variables in there, rock, snail, turtle. Um, I mean, there exists machine learning on a lot of stuff already. For example, here, MSAM, short for second anything, um, would allow you to input an image and then get some representations for pixels that belong together. And for example, here you could see that the frog um, consists of actually more than one. And groups of pixels belong together, but the M snail is definitely clearly these two things. And then, OK, we have some segmentation. We're not in the high dimensional space anymore. And use these as variables. That might be a start, sure. But even then, and this is what I tried to aim at with the discussion from before, it's not really clear already. Because for this, um, I looked at a single pixel and the segment anything model, then could tell me, okay, what are possible ways like this pixel belongs to other people. And on the like smallest level, there's the study of the snail, then the entire snail, and then even the frog as well, maybe. You could argue that this doesn't make as much sense, but there are definitely some like different stages, different abstractions for like which variables we would want to choose. Um, just saying that each pixel belongs to a specific variable is definitely not the only thing we want to say. And um, in general, if we want some representations, it's really hard to pretend that there's only one single crown truth, as there are so many multiple like perspectives you could have. Is it like a single variable? Or do we look at the entire thing? Maybe both at the time, if you're talking about, about abstractions, that would be great. Um, but I mean, then you have another more difficult problem. OK, very general motivation here. Um, let's look at something a bit more practical. Um, maybe you've seen this example already. Um, let's step away from causality for a minute. We have a classifier. And the classifier is trained on only cows and camels, two class classification car. And there's some training data, camel, camel, camel. Cow, cow, cow. Let's assume there are enough, more than three of each. And now we have our small classifier, which wants to predict, predict yeah, 
whether an image was a camel or a cow. Now, test data. Um, I think some of you might already imagine what the results be. are. I didn't try this out, to be honest, but um, it has been tried out by previous works. And yeah, the algorithm might then say, OK, the top one, clearly a cow. Bottom one looks like a camel. Um, why could the classifier think that? Because if we look at the training distribution, um, we have clear like color patterns for the camel, then we have the green grass for the cow. And if we only train with like these images and labels, then the classifier will use whatever information is like useful for the classification, no matter like what it actually represents. Um, this is another motivation because if we had so-called disentangled representations, so representations where we have really um, variables that represent one, well, meaningful thing in non-scientific terms. And then we could say, OK, yeah, the camel is really this part of the image, which is why. And based on this, we should classify as a camel and not based on the background. And if we have such representations, we shouldn't only care about which parts of the image um, belong to like which variables, but also how they relate to each other. In this example, for example, um, even though we, like as humans at least, know that camels usually or often live in a desert, we know that if we see a camel on the grass, it's still a camel. So not only having some representations, but also understanding the relations between the representations is important. Um, to finish up the motivation, we have seen for now um, called an inference, which is what we start with. We have some causal graph, and we have a set of causal variables. So yeah, as you've seen in the earlier lectures. And then I think Jonas had the causal structure learning lecture where we didn't know the causal graph, but we still knew what the variables are. And then we had to find out, OK, which variable was another, are they correlated in some way, whatever. And this basically removes both from the picture. So the topic of today, causal representation learning, is about the task where we have some representation. But this representation that we have is not the causal variables itself. And we really want to find out, OK, what are the causal variables we are interested in? Often depends on the specific task, but we'll get to that later. And I mean, usually what you can do once you have the causal variables, you could do the causal stru structure learning afterwards, or you do it together, but I get to all of that. Um, now, before I go more into the causality side, um, let me talk about representation learning in general a little bit. So um, one definition I found by Benjo is basically just saying, OK, representation learning means, in quotes, learning representations of the data that make it easier to expect useful information when building classifiers or other predictors. Um, the important part here is, or at least to me, um, it doesn't say that we learn like some ground truth correct representation. There can always, maybe not always, but usually be more than one correct representation. And the goal of representation learning is really to provide useful information for something after that. Um, for example, to make this point a bit more clear, um, representation learning, also feature learning, in that sense, is used in any like neural network or deep learning with at least one hidden layer. You have the inputs, and then you learn some other representation of the inputs, the features, hidden layers, and these are then used for some classification tasks, for example. So in a way, any neural network with hidden layers does representation learning, as in feature learning, um, to then help with the classification at the end. Um, I also want to add, just so that that is clear, representation learning does not exclusively has, have to be about images. We can also talk about um, text or multimodal representations we want to like disentangle or get different representations for. However, most research, research is centered around images, and also it makes the most sense when showing it. So this is where I will stick to it in, yeah, today in general. But just keep that in mind. We don't need to talk about images conceptually. So for representation bar, um, the usual setup is that we have some data, um, let's say um, p dimensions, um, which we assume can be described as sort of latent variables with d dimensions. And there the idea is, OK, our original space, the image space, for example, is much higher dimensional than the latent space. So for example, we have our image with 2,500 times 1,600 pixels. And here, if we say, OK, let's imagine some scenario where there are 1,000 classes, which can are binary, either true or false, one of these is frog, and so on and so on, then representation learning would mean, OK, taking this image, for example, here with the function h, and getting the representation 
of these entities, variables, and um, there. Then there's the other function from the representation to the image, um, often like the generative function, this one, RDG here. And yeah, so we have high dimensional to latent representation, and then the generative function from latent representation back to the high dimensional one. Um, one question to you. Do we want to choose that? Why and why not? So can we say that the not generative function is the inverse of the generative function? Yeah, I think you mean the correct thing because um, we could do this. And to be honest, sometimes it is even done. But what this implies is that on the one hand, the good point would be that we would have like a per could learn a perfect representation of any like input, but we couldn't um, capture the full space of the input images because if we have a higher dimensional space and then are looking for an invertible function to a representation and back, this means necessarily that there are um, some latent representations. Um, no, sorry, that there are some um, images like higher dimensional representations that we can't map to the latent space. Um, so yeah, this is usually why we have two different types of functions. And even though it would intuitively make sense to view one as the inverse to the other, um, this would restrict our problem quite a bit. Um, I think the maybe most famous example for representation learning are autoencoders. Um, here, basically, the thing of the last slide is more or less the entire idea. We have some input, again, usually images, not necessarily, practically usually, um, encode them into our latent representation, smaller dimension than the original representation. And then we have another um, neural network, the decoder, which can then reconstruct um, yeah, the original image as good as possible. Um, again, one question here. So we say that Z has to be smaller than X. Um, and that's basically the only constraint. What can we use such an autoencoder for? And what can we not use it for? OK, I always find this interesting because um, I'm not quite sure if you just, if you really don't know, you don't just don't want to say it. Um, because I thought autoencoders were quite common knowledge, but I mean, but that I'm asking. Yeah? Yeah, true. If you say that the input space is like can have any particular value, so that you fill the entire space, then yeah, obviously you can't. Any other idea why it would could not be as useful? Maybe even looking a bit at like Hazeltian interventions. I can also tell you. I thought it's more interesting if you think about it. All right. So I mean, the good point um, is obviously the goal of the autoencoder itself. Um, it really achieved um, successfully learns a compact representation that we can then use to reconstruct the original representation with minimal error. We can definitely cannot guarantee zero error, at least not for like in general. But usually, that is what is achieved by an autoencoder quite well. The problem here is, since this is the only like constraint, the only like loss we use to train this model, the encoded representation is something, literally. So um, it's definitely not disentangled, and we can't really understand it. So if we now say, OK, we have a latent representation, for example, then let's take the, that example again. And we say, OK, it should be 10,000 values, or yeah, 1,000 values in the latent representation then we would need to be incredibly lucky to have like one of these um, variables actually represent a frog or something like that. More likely, it's some entangled mismatch representation of a bit of frog, a bit of turtle, a bit of background, whatever. We don't have any influence on that with the usual autoencoder. The usual autoencoder is really just for compression and nothing else. Um, so then interpreting the latent space or actually intervening on it is basically impossible, at least like with a purposeful goal. 
Um, that's what variational autoencoders are for, to an extent at least. Um, here, instead of simply encoding one um, vacant representation alone, um, the vacant representation is encoded by a, a distribution with mean and variance, and um, usually Gaussians are used. And um, then the loss is not only with, about reconstruction, but also about re regularization. Um, I could have decided to talk half an hour about how this all derives and stuff like that for variation autoencoders. I don't think that's important for this lecture. If you're interested about all the mathematical details, there are a lot of really good blog posts online. Um, really, the only thing I want you to remember here is, OK, we have some data representation, which, by the means of training it, um, is in such a disentangled form, at least to an extent. Um, that the variables actually more represent something we would also interpret as variables and not some entangled mishmash of a representation. Like I said, there are good blog posts if you're interested. Look at it, otherwise it's also fine. Um, so if we have uncorrelated features, then these variation autoencoders work quite well. However, often features in our world obviously are not uncorrelated. One simple example here, let's say foot length and body height. There's definitely some correlation. Larger people have a higher foot length as well. So then if we look at some distribution, then we have like an oval shape here. And um, let's say we want that our autoencoder learns a representation based on data with these, um, based on some data, and the latent representation should have two features exactly. Now, what would probably be learned is a representation that looks like this. So we would have like one, M vector here and another vector here. So um, these two like red dotted lines I've drawn in there. Uh, we can see that using both of these together, then if you like you vary one and you vary the other, we basically represent the space of our data and that small people, small feet, large people, large feet, and so on, and pretty well. But this is not what we would understand as a disentangled representation. Because here, if we now look at one of these yeah, maybe variables and change it. And we would go along one of these red lines. So in other words, we would change both the foot length and the body height at the same time. Still, combining both of these variables, um, like linear combinations, we could get anywhere. But looking at only a single one at a time, we couldn't, we, we, wouldn't, we would change both of the like features we actually intend to represent. Is that clear so far? Otherwise, always feel free to like interrupt. Um, in that sense, for a disentangled representation, what we would rather want um, is that the features actually represent like the features as we intend them to. So like one horizontal and one vertical line. Um, what this paper, which I cited here, shows is that not only do autoencoders rather learn the entangled features, but also for good reason. Because if we just do that, then this results in a representation of the probability space which doesn't represent our data. Because now, as you can see, and um, when we have a nice oval shape for the entangled features, which really matches our distribution, here, now a person with like large body height and small foot length is just as likely as some person with a small body height and small foot length. So even though we would be interested in this entangled representation, um, we couldn't really say that we definitely prefer this representation over the other one, depending on what we want to use it for afterwards. Um, yeah, which is also here. Um, in other words, if we have some independence assumption on the latent variables, which is often used, then this can't help us with disentangled features. So if you say, because obviously these features are not independent. Um, yeah, the goal in general, of course, therefore, would be to learn interpretable disentangled features, but also looking at this example, um, learn them in such a way that they take mm -hmm. relations, correlations, and even like cause and effects of the real world into account as well. Um, okay, so at that point, I hope you understood why we're interested in representations, why we're interested in disentangled representations, and why we shouldn't always assume that these disentangled representation variables are independent of each other. Otherwise, I think I'm way too fast anyhow, so if you have any questions. Yeah? So, in the last slide, um, this circle or circular distribution 
mm -hmm. as a result from assuming independence of the business. Or because I don't see why this would be a circle if you yeah. have dependence. Completely correct, yes. Okay, so if they are dependent, then they are oval, but still have the right uh, aligned disentangled region. Mm -hmm. So well, if you're interested, um, there's also independent component analysis, um, which is an algorithm to um, get lower dimensional representations of higher dimensional data. And yeah, I mean, this generally works quite well, but there's also um, one of the core assumptions for it to work well is the independence of then these latent representation. And this is actually really, really, really common in non-causal representation learning. So I think most, hold me on that, but I really think most non-causal approaches would probably either learn the entangled representation to fit the data or learn a disentangled representation, which but then due to the um, independence of these latent features, yeah, doesn't represent our actual data space as well anymore. All right, then yeah, let's get to the core of this lecture, all the representation learning. Um, I've shown you this slide in the motivation already. Again, just to remind you, um, compared to causal inference and structure learning or representation learning, we now don't know the variables before. We want to find those out as well. Obviously, that also means we don't have the true causal graph. Um, this is basically the basic idea of causal representation learning. Um, yeah, when my, Matei told me I had to hold this lecture, um, I looked a bit at re literature, and to be honest, it can be, a, some people understand slightly different things. This is where they all agree, but then you can already have different setups and assumptions and causal graphs. I think one of the most common ones is um, that we have a setup like this. And this is from a lecture by uh, Chandler. Um, it's also online. If you want, I can send you the link, but it's quite math heavy. Um, let's look at it piece by piece. So at the top, we just have some latent representation. And this is a structural causal model. So we have some variables set, set one, set two, da, 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 set t, and they confirm to some DAG. So yeah, we have some causes, some effects, you know, cycles. That's what we assume is like the ground truth we are looking for, the true representation in that sense. And then the part below that uh, means that from this SEM as a whole, we generate our higher dimensional representation, the image probably, then x1, x2, x3 would be like single pixels of the image. And using the generative function, um, which uh, Chandler calls the mixing function, um, here, these observations obviously are not disentangled. Um, so that's some entangled representation. Um, then they also have um, these V variables, which here is random noise, um, which again, here is another implicit assumption already that the noise variables do not depend on the structural causal model and that this is then some randomness, meaning that a single state of like the or variable setting of the structural causal model can result in slightly different images which I think we would agree with, like a frog can look 10,000 different ways or whatever, but there are still some like variables in this representation which still lead us to say, yeah, that's a frog, even though two images of frogs can look quite different. And this is basically what the noise is for. Uh, yeah, just as a whole. So um, one reminder of previous lectures, we have the independent mechanism principle. Um, yeah, don't need to read all of it, but just to um, get to the most important part, it also says the conditional distribution of each variable given its causes, the its mechanisms, does not inform or influence the other conditional distributions. Um, if we have this assumption, this means that we actually um, have a disentangled representation, um, which then leads us to like multiple advantages. So first of all, we have modularity. Like the typical causality motivation is, okay, we have our structural assignments for each variable and we can intervene on a single one. And if some probability distribution of one cause changes, then the mechanism which causes other variables should still be, stay the same. That's the independence mechanism um, assumption. And this modularity um, implied by this principle then also allows us to do, do, do yeah, this, for this work out for distribution shifts, interventions, in general, going beyond the IID setting. Um, 
for that to work, we need those entangled representations. Because if we have an entangled representation, we can't just intervene on a single variable, as I've shown you in the like photo and end height example from before. If we have such a disentangled representation, we have our basically typical causality advantage. Um, models are more robust because we have all these components individually. We can transfer some components, or some probability distribution, knowledge about some variables, like other settings. Uh, it's much more interpretable if we have the variables and the respective probability distributions, and even more sample efficient as we can decide to only train some specific parts. However, um, from Yuna's lecture, you already heard that, okay, we have the task of all the variables and we want to um, get the causal graph, causal discovery. Even there, without any further assumption, you can't do it. You can't get identifiability. For this, like on the mathematical level, it's obviously even more difficult. So there are three basic high-level strategies um, you can go for to be successful in representation learning. Um, first of all, we have the mixing function, so the one from the latent variables to the high-level representation of the images. And you can say that this, you assume that this has some specific form, that, that you place a like prior on the function and say, okay, this mixing function has to look that or that. Then this, of course, reduces the possible functions, and then maybe you can do something. And another possibility is to place some other assumptions on the DAG. And the third is, uh, possibility is to include interventional data. Because if you have interventions, and then also like observational data, from that, it's obviously much easier to see what actually the variables are, which are then changed by such an intervention. Um, before I continue here, just one more example on that. Um, restricting the latent DAG is basically one possibility is also to just say, okay, let's say all of these latent variables are independent. And this is a restriction of the DAG. You could discuss whether you would still want to call this a DAG, yeah? Rest assumed. And basically, if it doesn't hold, then you have problems. Um, I mean, often, if it doesn't hold completely, you can still get, let's say, something useful. But obviously, you then lose all these like mathematical identifiability guarantees. So then you can't be surprised if it doesn't work anymore. Uh, so yeah, so the non-causal um, approaches to representation learning basically do just that. They restrict the latent DAG. And then we have independence of the variables in the non causal setting. And then this is one of the tools they use for that. OK, now then let's get to, OK, maybe before I do that, any questions? I think I should be a bit more slowly, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I tried it. Um, this following section, um, I have decided to give a rather broad overview over several approaches instead of like completely focusing on one. So I mean, if you're interested, of course, just tell us, Matei, me, or whatever. There are many approaches. I could like have 50 slides for just to show you, okay, assumptions, then this proves that, da, 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 and this is why we get identifiability. Um, I rather try to like select a couple of methods and give you more the high level idea and intuition. Um, there's much more to it, but I think for the purposes of this like single lecture on representation learning, uh, this makes more sense. So yeah, if you have any questions about that, I mean, feel free to tell me. And otherwise, you can, of course, also read up on your own, which we obviously won't require for the exam or something. Um, yeah, starting off, invariant causal prediction and um, short ICP. Um, this is actually, if you want to see it like that, not a full representation learning um, method because it has like one specific goal, which is um, classification. Um, the setup is that we have data from different environments. And here an environment means that we intervene on some variable for different environments. For example, here on the left, environment E1 is just the usual setup without any intervention, so some observational data on the problem. Then for environment E2, and in this example, there's intervention on the variable x2 and intervention on the variable x3. For the third one, intervention on the variable x4, x4. And we have these multiple environments with multiple interventions. Just like the data, the setup, 
um, for this problem. And then the goal is simply a classification of light. So again, we could look at images, um, assume that these are some latent variables, which some of which influence our class label, others are maybe influenced by our class label. And then here the setup is that we can, we, we have some data for interventions on these latent variables, um, which we can then use for the representation learning. Um, the basic idea here is that according to our causality, we have some structural assignments, so equations for each of the variables. And this means we also have one equation for our y variable. So I used this figure from the paper. Uh, Jonas, Tim, I'm not sure how we did this before. I think usually we would, if we do an intervention, and um, like remove the arrows going into the variables, just to make it more obvious that now this variable is not influenced by the parent anymore. Um, if you now imagine that's how we would do it, then we would um, not have the y to x3 arrow for the two, and we would not have the x5 to x4 arrow for e3. Now, the entire idea here is that, okay, we have interventions, can be on any variable, but on the target variable y. So now if we imagine that in the graphical form with the arrows pointing from some variable to others, we would never lose these arrows going into y. We could lose any others, but we would always keep the arrows going to y, because that's the assumption we never intervene on our class name. And this is basically the high-level idea here, that across all these um, environments, our assignment for y always stays the same. So, da, da, da. yeah. So we have our data set, which is um, pairs of like instances and labels from different environments. And um, then we can get the get the information of the variable they're looking for by finding out, okay, which function could we learn that fits all these environments? Because like I said, um, Y is always determined by its parents, obviously, and these parents always have an effect on this variable in all of our environments. And yeah, um, the setup here is that, again, this is a bit math heavy, but it should be still pretty easy. Um, we have our the, the value we're looking for, Y, Y, E, for the environment. Um, and this is just a general intercept term they call, so just like some additive term to represent anything. Um, and then we have a usual like linear SEM setup. So we have some coefficients, uh, schema, I think, thing beneath, um, which then multiplied with the latent variables and some noise and the intercept term resides in our variable. So again, one big assumption here, linearity. If we have some causal setup, some SEM, but nonlinear relations here, this method well, at, le at least has no guarantees. If it's still close enough to linear, it might still do something useful, but the assumption is linearity. And this is also a very common uh, assumption, and I'll get to that soon. Um, yeah, that's the idea. Um, yeah, the part on the right side, um, also, um, again, that we have that the noise is independent of the variables itself, um, similar to like the introduction for the causal representation I showed you earlier. Um, right, what this also implies is that we don't have any unobserved confounders. So there are no other variable which both influences y and x. So we assume that we really know all of these, can learn all of these x variables, and that there are no, not some unobserved ones which we only see the effect of, but not the variables as m themselves. So, um, as a short uh, break from representation learning, because I wasn't sure if this was talked about before, but to be honest, I, personally, I find this re really interesting. And um, this linearity assumption is something we see very often, not only in representation learning, but also in representation learning, but also for discovery or like any other causal methods. If you've talked about this already, then hey, perfect. Then I just tell you again. Otherwise, why do you think? Do we want to use the linearity assumption? And what does this mean? Hmm. That's one of the reasons. Hmm. 
Kita set list on ya. Oh. I actually haven't thought about that. Well, I guess that's true. Although I mean, you could go back on a lot of functions in general. But but yeah, no, it's still true. Yeah. Keep that in mind. Have you have a method later which actually does something similar? Also true. Okay, let's say um, again. Let's not care about representation learning for a second. Um, let's say cause and discovery. And we have one method, which is human linearity, and we have another method, which just learns any function using a neural network, like universal function approximator. Um, we have our training data. We train the linear model. We have our training data. We train the neural network model. Um, obviously, the neural network model is more expressive. It can learn linear functions. It can also learn nonlinear functions. Still, what could be an advantage of the linear model here? Mm, yeah, true. I also have not written that down, but it's definitely true. Mm. You, you just mean against overfitting or? Yeah, I, that, that basically goes in the right direction of what I want to say. So um, again, I mean, the obvious part is that, yeah, um, usually if we have not linearity or we have, don't have any assumption, um, then we have a lot of possibilities. Now, if we say linearity, then we already rule out much of the other possibilities. So it's much easier to like find some, identify some other solution. Um, also something which I think is worth stating, linearity, like if we look at our world, is actually quite common. I mean, you could also go for quadratic or whatever, but usually if you look at some relations, I mean, linearity is more often more often true than any other specific function I would assume by conjecture. Um, the part which to me really wasn't completely obvious before I heard it is that if we have this assumption of linearity, and obviously, I mean, if we make the assumption, we assume that it's true, but if it's then true, then we can train our model on the training data and extrapolate to any other region as well. So if we train between like zero and 10 and we have linearity, we can also make prediction for 20, 30, 100,000. And if we train a neural network on that, sure, it will get the zero to 10 pretty good. But now we ask the neural network for 20, I mean, it has no idea. Obviously, I mean, this all relies on the assumption being more or less true. Um, but especially in causality, we want to be able to extrapolate because that's the whole idea of intervention and counterfactuals, doing something which hasn't been done before. So if we can reasonably assume that the linearity assumption is, it doesn't have to be perfect, but close enough, let's really just say close enough, um, then this extrapolation ability is really important for interventions and stuff like that. So before I heard about that, I always viewed linearity more or less as, okay, sure, we make it easier because then it works and otherwise it wouldn't work. Obviously, we would prefer something else, but we can't. So that's why we use linearity. It's not completely false, but it's missing a bit the factor of, OK, if we have linearity and it's true, close enough, then we get a much more useful model. And also about what you also said with interpretability and all these things. So in that sense, I just want to like emphasize that linearity don't simply view it as, yeah, it's simple, easy, and we have to do it, but to an extent also as like possibility and chance. Looking at another model, yeah? Um, do, do, do. Um, so we have our SEM, and then we say that the functions are linear, like, like from cause to effect. So we have like the, the, the causes, here I mean the selector, these can be multiple ones, and times some vector plus some bias term, whatever. Yeah? Why does extrapolation fail if we have a true 
function that is non-linear. If it's true, it doesn't fail. But if you just use a neural network, how can you say that the function will be true for extrapolated terms for out of distribution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I mean. That this goes in the same direction. Yes, exactly. And yeah, I mean, you could also use a quadratic function. If, if that, that what, you, what you think is true, then it also works. But this is where I thought it was worth saying that, I mean, linearity is still true more often than like other functions. If you know the function, of course, then say this has to be the function and just use it. But often you don't know and linearity is like the most easy maybe one to do choose. Would be just due to the fact that we can um, approximate every function or kind of every function with a Taylor series and take the linear term, which is in the local area close enough. So mm. in physics, uh, I think they do this all the time. <laughs> yeah, then you couldn't really extrapolate that then, right? Yeah, but somehow it's close enough for, so the close is um, yeah really dependent on the context. Yeah, I mean, true, of course. Um... <laughs> yeah. Again, like obviously, if at some point the linearity assumption is just completely false, then all the advantages disappeared, obviously. There, there still has to be some truth about this. If it's like close enough for the area you intervene upon, it's still useful. You can use it. Okay, right, sure. But if there's a quadratic function and you just pretend it's linear, maybe it will work out like well enough in like some region where you don't notice it. But then if you do an intervention on like 10,000 now, obviously it will fail. I mean, linearity is not like the holy grail of everything. Just to make that clear. As well. Any other question? All right, then let's continue. Um, another representation learning method is called invariant causal representation learning, um, short ICARL. Um, I think most of you won't care about that, but just to make sure, there's also another method, incremental classifying representation learning, called ICARL. Um, these are two completely different things. And if any of you um, have seen or will see the continual learning lecture by Martin Mund, um, they talk about this ICAL, not that ICAL. So just to avoid any confusion here, different things, both representation learning, but other than that, very little similarities. And if you haven't heard of the top right, perfect, then just continue. Um, generally, same goal as the ICP from before. Um, so we want to have a classifier, which is invariant um, to the features we don't care about. Um, but here um, in their paper, they have a more generous setup and possible possible functions, also including like nonlinear functions. And what they're saying basically is that okay, um, our latent variables here x notations are different. I usually use uh, z before it's x, still the same thing. Um, can form like any um, deck as long as deck there are no cycles. And yeah, and they also assume that the environment doesn't directly influence the um, output or the label, but only through these latent variables. Um, then keeping at high level here, the general idea here is, okay, first identify latent variables. So all these X thingies, then determine which are the direct causes of parent of Y, because the entire idea of these invariant predictions is that these are the only things we need to know to find out more about Y. So if we have some variable and want to find out what it is, then we only need its direct parents. Um, yeah, and then the third step, okay, we have the direct parents, just learn a predictor, usual classification. Um, they have one experiment on colored MNIST. Um, colored MNIST, um, does any one of you not know MNIST? The usual? No. Okay, perfect. So MNIST, just digits, um, digit classification, that's it. Uh, for colored MNIST, um, yeah, these digits are in some specific colors. And here the color is curiously correlated with the label. So obviously the color doesn't help with predicting the label, but there's some correlation. And again, looking back at the camo tau example from the start, if we don't tell the classifier anything about that, it might pick up on the spirit correlation, even though we don't want that. Um, so what you can see, well, what they did for this experiment here is um, both left and right is the same thing, just different like examples. Um, Sticking to the top row, there 
this shows like the same image, the same high-dimensional representation, just chip, um, just with the difference that one of the latent variables is intervened upon. And then looking at the reconstruction of the image um, there. So, okay, let's me phrase it differently. This was a bit not clear, I think. So we have the latent representation, which we learned. Then um, we look at an image here. This is, for example, the first one on the left. Then looking at the same latent representation, we intervene on some on, on one variable, generate another image, intervene on the same variable again, generate another image, and this is one row. For the top row in particular, um, the intervention, da, 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 da. yeah, we intervened on a variable which is a cause of our class. I mean, because this we found out in the method, we determined the direct causes. So the top row shows an intervention on one variable which we determined as a direct cause of our label. And as you can see, yeah, the, the left one on the top left there, I don't know, this is a three maybe. It's definitely a bit weird. The second one might be a five or definitely a bit weird. And then further to the right, it's still an eight. And for the second example as well, we're starting off at something like a nine, maybe moving towards a five, three at the end, possibly. Um, so I would say it's plausible to say that, okay, yeah, whatever we changed here had an impact on our digit. On the other hand, the bottom row now, we intervene on a variable which is an effect. So that should not change our class, which is in the digit. And as we can see here, yeah, eight, 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 eight three, three. Ah, okay, a bit difficult to be honest, three, three, but the color changes. Again, I mean, yeah, it's not perfect, perfect, but I think it's pretty clear to see that for the top row, yeah, we're definitely changing something about the digit. For the bottom row, much less so. Was that example clear now? Yeah? We basically use the Yeah, so, so we're intervening on the latent representation and then running our decoder. I can't tell you how cherry pick that is, to be honest. <laughs> um, I mean, they ran these three steps, so they had the direct causes. Um, I don't think in that algorithm it's immediately clear what it represents, but it represents something, and then you can do interventions to like find out roughly what it does. So, um, yeah, I mean, they, they knew that they were intervening on a cause or an effect, and yeah. Did that answer your question? No, 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 obviously not. I thought you meant the, uh, I'm not sure. I, I would need to look that up. Sorry. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, do you know how many latent uh, driving data generating process, right? So the color in this case and the, the number. So I think based on that, you can come up with some kind of informed guess on how many latent need. I think that's the way you typically choose to do the main data. You can do a trade of that. And in, in this case, it's the uh, construction, right? So okay. if you uh, construct your, your, your instance data. Yeah, and then also just in general for everybody, um, what Jonas also said, many, I'm not sure if there are some representation learning methods which do differently, but many of these representation learning methods basically just assume some latent representation size and then the idea is, okay, you can try out more or less and then see how that develops. Um, I'm not sure if there's some like research which really directly also finds the correct size. There is, but not really closely related. At okay. least I don't know what it is, but it's really So again, like the main goal here is the interest in the class label, the, the, the why this like entire goal is different. Um, 
yeah, I mean, this experiment synthetically generated, right? They, they can say, okay, these are the costs, these are the effects. And then if that's roughly what's learned, perfect. Um, if you mean like in more real problems, yeah, that's much more difficult. Um, I get to something there later, but yeah, I mean, it's not easy. Anything else on that? Right, next one. So I hope you still remember the autoencoder. Um, causal VAE is another paper um, which yeah, takes the variation, variational autoencoder and then instead of having like only some vector or even like mean invariance in the data representation, there's an entire SEM in there. Um, the figure is maybe a bit much. Don't worry, it's not all completely important, but I mean, feel free to go into more detail if you want to. Again, the same autoencoder idea. So first we have our X, um, encode that, da, 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 then we do some stuff, then decoder and reconstruct the X. Um, then we do some stuff, is then the causal part. Um, here, an SEM is used. Um, again, one of the assumptions here is what you see in equation one. Um, that A times Z um, then determines the latent variables. So again, we have a multiplication here. We assume a linear model in the latent representation. Um, but to be fair, here um, matters what I think you said before. Um, we have some encoder before that. So in a way, this allows for maybe more than linear um, relations because we first encode in some other representation and then imply linearity on that representation. I'm sure it still restricts it in some way, and I can't tell you how much exactly. But um, yeah, I mean, the encoder should definitely help to like be more expressive there. Um, yeah, the idea, what you see on the right side there is that in A, um, the matrix A, we have our causal graph, just encoded as an adjacency matrix. So if the value is zero, then we multiply with the respective variable times zero. So we delete the influence of the variable. So every time a value in our JSON matrix is zero, then this basically means that the respective input variable is not a cause of our yeah, variable we want to calculate. Um, in this latent SEM representation, we now have our latent variables. And now we can also intervene on a latent variable, then run our JSON matrix there. We basically apply them. And then this simulates the intervention in the latent encoded space. Um, yeah, that's the idea here. Um, the, the what I didn't talk about here is next to X, we also have this U which goes in there. And these U's are um, the true causal concept. So to be fair, we're really giving a lot of supervision like signal there as help. But again, if we manage this, we can then have our SEM representation we can intervene on. Um, yeah, the, the adjacency matrix A and the masking there allows for interventions. And then um, part of the loss is also some constraint um, on A, which makes sure that A is, yeah, doesn't have any cycles because we want our cyclic SEM. Uh, SEM. Um, but yeah, if you train this and have the necessary information, the, the use, then you can do some funny things. Um, so taken from that paper here, um, the top left is like each row is basically the same representation, but intervention on something. So on the top left, intervention on gender. So from left, if it's more female, to the right, more male. And then, for example, yeah, then for top right, intervention on smile, bottom right, mouth open, bottom left, eyes open. And what they um, circled here in some parts is then, okay, um, depending on what we intervene upon, other variables change as well if they are caused by that or don't change if they are not caused by that. So this then the SEM part, right? Um, so here for this example, it would mean that, okay, um, gender also changes the eyes, whether they are like open or closed, but um, not the other way around. So we have like one cause effect relation, but only in one direction, obviously. And yeah, same for smile and mouth open. Like if, if, how, how much we smile causes our mouth openness to change, but how much we change our mouth openness doesn't influence how much we smile. Yeah. yeah. At some point, uh, you probably met with a test to know that 
Now, means it is yeah, that's the supervision signal in you. So those are there during training, we give the crowded concepts and we try to really learn that. So again, we kind of have the representation already in a way. I mean, maybe. But again, at least if you have this information, then you can really learn this. And then the intervention is um, what's shown here. So you first intervene on, on the set vector on the left, then apply the causal graph, and then you have to intervene on the result again just to make sure that this wasn't affected by something else. Um, but yeah, I mean, from there to there, then the effects of your intervention um, take place in the other variables. And the picture of it, um, also the causal graph is given into this vector. And then that's actually linked. That's, yeah. Yes. Okay. So then it's the result that we find this causal relations between the ground rules concept or so um, you mean like the mouth yeah. open and smile? Yeah. So yeah, I think that's learned yeah. or the observation or is it, um... so again um, we enforce a simplicity on a so we know that a obviously learns I mean it learns a gag in that sense has to um so if one influences the other it can't be the other way around. So if you then train for that and I guess the model found out during training that the direction from smile to mouth change uh, makes more than sense than the other way around. Okay. So yeah, yeah, but within here there's some cross discovery happening. Yes. Could they go ahead and generate the variables for gender and the rate of smile or something, and then manually change um, the it's the standard A data set they use, which I think has binary annotations. So then smile, not smile. And then um, but, but yeah, that, that's, that's you. That's you. And they just go ahead and plug in like a floating point value for a zero one classification and then get something. Uh, yeah, I think so. No, if you want to know more, let me know after the lecture. I can look at the toolkit paper again. Um, any more question on the VAE? Call the VAE. All right. Um, let's look at another method. This is called implicit latent causal models. Um, yeah, let, let's start with like, so, so again, previously we've seen that, okay, we always need some assumption or additional information. And um, here the information we have is quite strong on one hand quite weak on another hand. So basically what they have is they always have pair of samples, pairs of samples. We have one original um, sample, for example, like the dominus stones on the top. And then we have one, I think it's fair to call it counterfactual one um, on, on the bottom. And then for the counterfactual one, you made some intervention. For example, you um, pushed on the like second dominus stone there. And then you also observe how that impacted the other variables. And now you have these pairs, original and counterfactual, and this is like your base of information um, to learn the representation. Um, again, to be fair, that's quite an assumption to have. On the other hand, that's more or less all. Um, so they don't know what the intervention is beforehand. So you don't say this is an intervention on stone two or something. You just say, okay, original, interventional, original, interventional. However, you don't know when, um, how exactly. And then if you have enough of these pairs, um, yeah, then you can actually learn, learn your stuff. Um, this also implicitly means that you can only learn the representation for vari variables that has been intervened upon at least once, because otherwise they don't know that they're, the, the algorithm can't tell that they're like distinct variables, not intended to be something else. Um, Again, I mean, there are some other assumptions um, in place here, um, some of which could maybe be weakened, others probably not so much, but this would really go into a lot, lot of maths and going through the through the full proofs or anything, I think isn't of much use here. And to be honest, I'm not really so well informed in that as well. But yeah, basic idea here, um, instead of like placing really strict assumptions on linearity or something, or even giving like some concepts as information. We have counterfactual pairs 
And if you observe enough of these, we can always find out, okay, what are the differences? Okay, this has to be variable, this has to be variable. If, you, if, if an intervention on one changes something else, so this probably is a cause-effect relationship, and this as the basis of information can be used yeah, to discover more here. To look at one experiment where they do that. Um, so here, this is like a setup where we have three plates and a robot arm, or like three, what's it called? I don't know, color thingies, color lights. Um, the robot arm moves above these three colors. And then we have our causal graph on the right side here, which basically says, okay, um, if we're above the blue one, the blue is on. If we're above the green one, the green is on. If we're above the red one, the red is on. But also, if the blue is on, the red is on. And if the green is on, and the red is on. So we have some causal relations here. Um, Yes, then the top row, uh, there they vary the uh, latent variable um, independently without like any causal modeling. And then for the robot arm, this which is represented by that variable changes, but none of its effects change because there is no causality model in there. Um, but for the bottom one, on the other hand, um, now we, we have learned this disentangled causal representation. We move about the green one and the green and red is on. To be honest, I think it's a bit difficult to see when the red light is on. But if you pay more close attention, maybe look at the slides later by yourself. Yes, it's it, it works as intended. <laughs> and yeah, so, so if green is on, red is on as well. If red, uh, blue is on, red is on as well. And if it's above the red one, that's on. If it's above neither, then neither is on. Um, so yeah, and this was quite high level, but I want to keep it at that. Nevertheless, any questions on that? Okay. Then let's get to the last one for today. Um, so I mentioned earlier that for representation learning, we don't really have like the one single current truth representation. We can always say, okay, yeah, this is the single representation we want to learn without any specific task or goal in mind. Um, so this paper has a specific goal, which basically says, okay, we have two groups of variables. So like our latent representation is um, can be divided into two groups, content and style. Um, and the goal here is then, okay, let's look at data augmentation with the like causal lens and find out, okay, can we represent the content and the style parts of the image? Um, to this end, they propose a causal graph. So we have our observation X, the image. Um, then we have two variables, S and C, the style variables and the content variables. Um, both influence how the image looks like, obviously. I mean, what you see, like the label for classification, for example. And um, is visible in the image, but the style obviously as well. And then if you do style change from S to like the augmented S, um, then you also get an augmented image. The image looks different than the original one because the style is different. Um, so we have then yeah, the augmented and style and image, but the content is still the same if you only augment the style. Um, why do we assume that the content causes the style? Why not? Why does? Why don't we draw the error from F to Yeah. Um, I don't think that's really the answer I'm looking for. Because the style is uh, much lower dimensional. So if you try to define a comic by a style, then for each style, they could only be one uh, comic. Can you rephrase that? I mean, um, we can have one style for multiple kinds of comics. Comics? Comics. Did, did I say comic? Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry. If I said comic, I mean content. Okay, so, so maybe, maybe it's my bad here. So, so C is the content. So basically, if we have an M if we, we have some goal again, classification, cows, chemists, then the content would be everything for the cow, and the style could be the background. We don't want the style to influence our label of the cow, but it obviously still influences the image. Okay. Sorry if I confused you best. Okay, then then let me ask differently. Um, I think 
hopefully it's clear that the content should be a cause of the image as well as the star. Anyone disagrees? Okay, so I think we can draw these like yellow lines very confidently. Now let's say, okay, I disagree because I mean, this is an assumption in some way. We didn't prove this or something. We postulated this as our problem formulation. So now, okay, I say, no, I disagree. Let's draw an arrow S to C. Yeah? Okay, yeah, the content in content influences the style. Um, yes, I agree. Okay, before I say more. Yeah, that's correct. Or well, let me phrase it differently. Let's say we have style two contents. So, so this purple arrow was switched around. And then we obviously still have content to X. Now we do an intervention on the style. Now this will change the content. But that's exactly what we don't want, right? Is we want that the style um, is not, yeah, um, that the content is independent of the style because like we want to make our classification based on the content. But if we make our classification based on the content and the content is caused by the style, then suddenly our label is also caused by the style because the style, the style then would be an ancestor of our label because style to content to label. Is that clear now? So yeah, in other words, the class prediction should be invariant to the style and it must not depend on it, yeah? It's yeah. basically what you said. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I mean, it depends on what we want to predict. And in that sense, again, maybe my bad, maybe I wasn't clear enough. The entire idea, obviously, is that the style is just some visual thing which influences the image, but which is not important for our task later. I don't think I made this clear enough, so sorry for that. Yeah, true. Correct, obviously. If you want to classify the style, then I don't know, we would probably... And, and this would just be the same variable, I guess? And we would just have one variable for that, yeah. Um, yeah, um, if you have the setup, and again, we say that style is not important for our classification we want to do or whatever, um, then our task basically boils down to a counterfactual question. What ha would have happened if the style variables had been randomly perturbed or else being equal? And I mean, the idea is that the style could be in any way and we would still get our this is the same content. Because, yeah, I think that, that, that that's what I was missing, right? Um, because data augmentation and machine learning is usually used to make a bigger data set and, and a more varied data set. So if you have like an image of, of a cat, then you can also augment this image, maybe rotate a bit, maybe crop a bit, maybe like uh, mirror the image, and then you have more diverse data. And then this um, helps your classifier be invariant to these changes of style. Um, so this is the goal and idea behind it, right? You do use data augmentation to create different images um, where you know that what you actually want to learn from these images remains the same even after your data augmentation, but other things change. So this then causes the classifier to not pay attention to these other things that you changed. Sorry, I should have stated that earlier. Um, so with that in mind, this counterfactual question, what would have happened if the style variables had been randomly perturbed or else being equal, could of course mean that um, be answered by something like that. Um, our labels should be exactly the same in our prediction for what we want to do afterwards. Um, yeah, again here, um, they fix the size of the content representation. Again, I mean, you could argue that you can just try multiple things out and at some point you know the perfect size. Um, then they achieve identification by finding a function. Do, 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 do. Um, oh yeah. Um, yeah, they, they learn a function um, which learns the style and which learns the content in particular, and at the same time avoids a collapsed representation. Um, they have multiple possibilities. Um, I've printed one on the poster here on the slide. Um, so the 
gx minus gx augmented part uh, means that okay, we want this function, we want to learn the function g. This function should give more or less the same result for both the augmented and the not augmented image because we want to extract the content and we say that the content is the same for the, both the augmented and the non, -non augmented one. Um, we need a bit more because if we would not have the part starting at the right minus, so the hgx, if we would not have that part, then we would could just learn the function g which maps to zero, everything. Perfect loss. Um, so this is what H is for. It avoids a collapsed representation, makes, makes sure that we actually learn something different for different images with different contents. Um, but then this loss can be used to learn such a function g, which then really just extracts the content and not the style. Um, questions on that? Yeah? And it will run a representation. So, so some latents, some sets that you used the notation I used before, um, where they encode like cow features, but not desert features. Mm -hmm. And then if you would really like literally crop the cow and put it in a grassy background, then it should result in the same contact vector, more or less. All right, I worked out quite well with time. Um, so some summarizing thoughts at the end. And here I wanna ask you one last time. So now having seen like a couple of different causal representation learning papers, at least on the high level, um, what do you think about the field? Um, what works well? What are problems, challenges? What's your impression? I mean, there's no false answer here. I'll wait a bit. Okay. slides. Um, okay. Also, I mean, we have a recording as well, so I'll try to describe that. Um, if we have our causal model, and with, I don't know, four variables or so, then you can have the like joint factorization, right? I'm saying the probability of A, B, C, D is the probability of, and then, and then if you have a causal graph, you can basically say, um, like the the variables which have no cause. So the, the probability, let's, let's say we have A causes B, and let, yeah, just that for that now, right? Then you can do the joint factorization as probability of A times probability of B given A. Um, this is a disentangled representation as we have um, in two factors, the distribution for A and the distribution for B. Um, if we have a non-disentangled rep representation, and this would basically mean that the probability distribution of AB is the probability distribution of AB. If we don't have causal knowledge, then that's all we can do, basically. Um, so there, both A and B is very much entangled. But for the other case, probability of A times probability of B given A, we have one factor for A, one factor for B. These structural assignments for the respective variables. Now, if I tell you, okay, we have just probability of AB, intervene on that. Can't do. I mean, you lack information. On the other hand, if you have the other one, the, the causal perspective, and you know that this conforms to a causal graph, I mean, of course, you can always say otherwise, but you know that this is the causal graph, this, you have the structural causal model in particular, then you can say, okay, yeah, we intervene on A by changing the probability distribution for A. We intervene on B by changing the probability distribution of B given A, and you can then also say, okay, now I'm not given A anymore because I just said it, whatever. Um, so if you have a causal model, 
in your later representation, then this is a disentangled representation in that sense. Did that answer your question? Okay, yeah, I mean, if A causes B, you can also say the probability of AB is the probability of B times the probability of A given B. I mean, this is also true on the observational level, but I mean, either you can't intervene on that or you intervene, but not correctly. <laughs> so that, that, that's why, why I was saying that the probabilistic perspective obviously only makes so much sense. We, we don't need like, some probabilities we need the structural causal model because then we really have the causal effects. I mean, that's the entire idea of causality, right? That just using only the probabilities, we are not causal. We can't do that. Anyone wants to give any thoughts on that? I think the is the data function. So I can go ahead and the evolution in cases where I really just care about correlations. Um, but every model I get out is solely self-contained. And that means any analysis part I do to transfer or to extract human level knowledge from our model. So maybe um, I do causal inference and then I find this variable that has a great effect on my output. And then I have to still go ahead and try to figure out, okay, what does this mean for me? What, what am I changing really? Um, so what I would think would be a great benefit would be a way to incorporate a base structure that could then be applied to take off this load. So um, if I have a repeated setting, for example, and then analyze data that comes from some broad equal use case, uh, I could maybe identify more or less stable global patterns that I could assign some meaning to that I already know, or uh, something that makes sense to me, and then try to break down my causal chain in terms of maybe not exclusively, but in parts these pre-prepared building blocks I've already analyzed and know what they do uh, to maybe make the output more useful for human reason, instead of just having a model that does work mathematically, but it's kind of still a black box to me because I don't know what I'm changing when I think like X227. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's more understandable. What? It's more understandable. If you have a nice latent representation, doesn't tangle one. Yes, and uh, what well, I guess that would be then just draw huh? um, But I still have to figure out like, what what does this do to the thing I'm actually caring about, right? Yes. So um, just if I find out that these variables are very influential, that doesn't tell me much about one. So when may if I can treat them specifically yet, right? um, but if what then you want to go ahead and uh, say, I guess this factor in the real world is very influential. I have to map like something in the real world to this factor before it's really useful for us. Yeah, I'm mean, true. Um, was quite in detail. Okay, then I won't torture you anymore and give you my personal thoughts. Um, again, I mean, there's no completely like true or false here. Um, one thing like worth remembering for me is that first of all, just if we have some observation image, there's not a single like true representation. And um, there's definitely one like we as humans would find reasonable. There's also definitely those which are useful for classifiers or for like specific purposes. But in contrast to, for example, um, causal discovery, where it's much easier to say, okay, if we have these variables, then this is the current truth, at least like given um, the DAG assumption. I think that's mostly really quite clear. Okay, this is the current truth, everything else is false. And um, really not as much in representation learning. And another thing, if you remember all the papers I showed you like in the last section, even current research is really often, almost always, I think, um, just test on any like synthetic problems where we then can influence the data generative, generative process where we know our assumptions are correct and, and where we can generate counterfactuals maybe. 
and obviously as well, and that reinforcement learning in general um, relies on very specific assumptions. Um, to that end, one thing I want to say here is that this, of course, also like is due to lack of benchmarks. Um, this entire thing of like crown truth representation and specific assumptions and so on, I don't really know like any like cool real world causal representation learning benchmark. Um, if you have one, let me know. It would be great. Um, but obviously, this makes it much more difficult. Maybe we have cool results in our synthetic problems. But, but how and what do we apply it for in practice? I mean, we don't have a model which really works on like any image for any purpose. We have to restrict it to something specific. I'm not saying it's impossible. Definitely not. But it's definitely quite challenging. Um, however, more on the brighter side, I mean, if we have these assumptions, if these assumptions are satisfied, and um, representation learning, and then also manipulation of the latent space works quite well, looking at the like auto encoder and also the other things I showed you, um, everything they did, all the experiments they did, I mean, the results were amazing, I think, and that was quite cool. Still, um, yeah, I mean, it's very much an open research topic still. If you're interested in causality and representation learning, there's lots to do, no worries about that. Um, so yeah. So just to conclude, causal representation learning, the entire idea, learning low dimensional representations for of higher dimensional data. Um, for causal representation learning in particular, the latent representation is an SEM. Um, then if you have causal representations, you basically have the usual causality advantages um, due to the mod modality, um, with transferability, sample efficiency, interpretability, you're being able to apply interventions, yada, 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 yada. Um, Generally, identification is impossible without any assumptions, same as for causal discovery, but here I would say it's even a bit more difficult. Um, so either assumptions or further information, or to be honest, um, often more than one of these things. I mean, even if even for the things where you have interventional counterfactual data, it's not rare that there's still some other assumption. I mean, even darkness is an assumption already. Um, so I'm often a combination on that. Um, in that sense, current research is, um, right now mostly focuses on rather specific problems, but I mean, I'm sure there's a lot to come in the next years. So, um, just one final thing, um, because I mean, Matthias, the guy usually has this lecture and he had some requirements and I almost, almost missed one. Uh, yeah, about that. Good. Um, are there any questions? Okay. Oh man, I'm still getting recorded. Can't tell you stay at home. Um, I think it's a recap mostly. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, okay. Let me just say, and that's definitely true, Mate is aware that this is like Friday afternoon right before Christmas. Um, I think there'll be just a normal lecture here. I think it's more like question answering. Mate probably has some recap stuff prepared. I think, I don't know. Um, I mean, if you have time, yeah, obviously come. Mate will be happy to see some people here. Not everybody comes to Christmas already, but I mean, we're recording every lecture. We'll also record the one next. And I mean, it's understandable if you go to your family. Sorry? <laughs> Look, I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mama Tay said he will update the stuff until Tuesday. Right now, he's in, he's, he's, he's not in, um, not here. He's in New Orleans. Um, so, quite busy at the moment. But yeah, I mean, I remind him as well. He knows the, the stuff, including this lecture, will be up until Tuesday. And I think he'll also make sure to upload the Friday lecture of next week. At least this year. <laughs> I hope. Anything else? Thank you. Then have a nice weekend. <laughs>